Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon's based on the gospel account, and that is found in your worship folder. If you would turn to that again, uh, the congregation will please stand as these words of Jesus are being read from Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before him Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. And then a cloud appeared and enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Lord Jesus, we ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit on the words proclaimed and heard in your saving name. Amen. Life has special moments in which God reveals his glory to us. In fact, uh, Psalm 19 makes it very clear that the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth proclaims his handiwork. A couple of weeks ago, I saw the family cat sitting near the patio, catching the first rays of the sun that were coming up in the, mo- in the morning to warm its body. And I thought to myself, isn't it amazing? 93 million miles away, we have this bright star that is sending light and warmth on this earth perfectly set up and strategically located by our Creator God to provide life and light here on this earth. You see the glory of God in nature. But today, with Peter, James, and John, we get to go up onto this mountain and see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ revealed in a very special way. Because you see, their experience is also our experience. Because the Holy Spirit has opened up your eyes to see Jesus Christ as your Lord and your God, what they experienced on that mountain was not just restricted to three of just his, Peter's, of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John. That experience is your experience and my experience this morning. And we can say with Peter in full enthusiasm, Lord, it's good to be here. It's good to see your glory here. Your glory as the very Son of God. Going back to our text, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. Transfigured. The Greek word is metamorpheo, from which we get our word metamorphosis. I learned that big word when I was in first grade. In a small community we lived in, the farming community where we had a small Lutheran school, one of the students had brought a caterpillar on a milkweed plant. And we watched as it ate the milkweed and brought fresh milkweed to it. And it was transformed. It was changed and became a beautiful butterfly, a monarch butterfly. butterfly. And the teacher said, now we're going to learn this word. And we learned it together, metamorphosis. Jesus looked like a human being as he went up to the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and then he was transfigured and changed. His garments changed in front of them. It was Mark Twain who wrote a short story about the prince and the pulper. And two boys happened to look exactly alike, even though they weren't related. One was a prince and one was a very poor person, a pulper. And they exchanged places, and the prince wore the clothes of the pulper. But yet he was still a prince. And here Jesus came into this world and became fully human, wore our clothes, walked in sandals, ate our food, 
And now he shows them the full glory as God by letting his clothes and his exterior appear and suddenly appear in all of its glory. What a glorious moment that was for Peter, James, and John, it says in our text. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. In the other gospel accounts, it says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became bright like a flash of lightning. That moment is further enhanced in its glory when Elijah and Moses are appearing with Jesus and talking to him, one of the other accounts says about his departure, about ascending back into heaven to be with his father. And this was such an overwhelming experience for Peter, James, and John that Peter says, Lord, it's just good to be here. It's so good to be here and see you in your full glory as God. Later they would write about this. They never forgot about it. Jesus told them, don't tell anybody till after I rose from the dead. But after he rose from the dead, they certainly shared that with everyone. In fact, John writes in his gospel, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But then Peter gets even more specific in his epistle as he recalls that moment on that holy mountain when he says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we went with him on that sacred mountain. But you see, what Peter and James and John saw with their eyes and heard with their ears, you have also seen with your eyes of faith and heard with your ears of faith that have been opened up by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Because Peter, in that same letter, goes on to say how this glory comes to us today. He says, And we have a more sure word of the prophets made more certain, and ye will do well to pay attention to it to a light shining in a dark place. The Word of God can shine in the darkest places of your life and bring you the glory of Jesus the way the glory was brought to them on this holy mountain. And there will be dark moments in your life. And there will be dark places. And there will be dark valleys. And in those dark valleys and dark moments and dark places, the word of God comes to you and brings you visions of Jesus and his glory in such a way that you never forget them for the rest of your life. You see, the disciples were going through a dark moment. It's significant that at the very beginning words here, it says this happened six days later. You say, well, what happened six days before? That was significant. Six days before you read the previous chapter, Jesus is telling them what's going to happen to him when he goes up to Jerusalem, and he's getting very specific about what's going to happen to him. Remember what Peter did. Peter was so upset with that, he rebuked Jesus and said, you can't go up there. And Jesus said to him, what? Get behind me, Satan. You don't know the things of God. You only know the things of men. And then Jesus talked about a cross that they would have to bear for him. These were not easy times. They were dark times for the disciples to hear about Jesus' suffering and the suffering they would have to go through if they followed Jesus and bear a cross for him. And in those darkest moments, a light shines so brightly they're with Jesus on this holy mountain, and they see his glory. Very dear Christian woman once said, There's no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper. You know that from the book of Job. You read the book of Job, and here's a man that's sunk into the darkest, deep, deepest darkest valleys of despair and depression. And then it reaches almost its ultimate in chapter 19 where he's angry at God and pouring out his anger to his friends. The darkest moment of his life and suddenly what happens? He bursts forth with his vision of glory that's given to him. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. There's no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper. There's no dark moments and dark valleys in life where the light cannot shine so brightly and you see the glory of God in a way you've never seen it before and you say with Peter, Lord, it's good to be here. Lord, it's good to be here. 
It's good to hear the Father's voice speaking about His Son in such a wonderful way. Going back to our text, it says, Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to Him. Do you remember that happened once before? Sure you do. It happened at Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and the Holy Spirit came down from heaven from a cloud in the form of a dove. Then the Father spoke from heaven those wonderful words, and people heard at John the Baptist and others around him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Our Father speaks about his Son and says, I love him. The Father loved his Son from all eternity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we cannot begin to imagine the closeness that existed. Jesus talked about being in the bosom of the Father. And this closeness now is also experienced here on this earth. Because as a fully human being, Jesus is living the perfect life none of us could live. Because you understand, although Jesus was God from all eternity, he's also fully human. John made that clear when he said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the book of Hebrews says he was tempted in all parts as we are, yet without sin. And now the Father's looking at this perfect life that Jesus lived, the only perfect life that has ever been lived on this earth, and he says, this is my son, I love him dearly. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Father spoke these words for Jesus. Jesus needed to hear the approval of his heavenly Father on the life that he lived. And at the end of his life, the Father would raise him from the dead, the ultimate proof that he accepted and loved the life that Jesus lived, that we could never live. What are the three most important words that you can ever hear in life? Are they not the words, I love you? Husbands, you need to say that to your wife all the time, I love you. And wives to your husbands, I love you. And children need to hear that from their parents, I love you. My brother Charlie called the other day. Talked to him in a nice talk, and at the end of the conversation, I said, Charlie, I love you. And he said, Steve, I love you. I love those words. When my mother was dying, we were all around her bed. She woke up from a long, you know, in and out, as they are with the final days. I remember woke up, a smile came to her face, and the face and the first words that came out of her mouth were, I love you. I've never forgotten those words. But you know, the Heavenly Father cannot say to Steve Dagner, I love you. Not on the basis of the life that I live, because my life and your life is certainly not pleasing to our Heavenly Father by itself without Jesus. I look into my life and I see nothing but deceit. And that's made very clear by Jeremiah chapter 17, where it says, The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can begin to understand it? How could the Father love me when my heart is so deceitful? Why is it that people don't take little animals into their home and make pets of them if they come from a coyote family or a wolf family? a raccoon family. You don't try and take these little creatures into your house and tame them because they will turn on you and it could be very bad for you. So it is with the human heart. Deceitful above all things, it turns on us. It turns on us in ways we could never imagine. Takes us down paths. How could I ever find myself down that path? How could my Heavenly Father ever say, I love you to me? Not what I see in myself, but what I see in Jesus on this holy mountain. As the Father says to him, I'm pleased with the life my son has lived. And Jesus did live the perfect life for you and die the perfect death for you. Make no mistake about it. Everything you've ever done wrong, every deceitful thought in your human heart has all been placed on Jesus and he paid for it completely at the cross. And he lived the perfect life you could never live The Father says, I'm pleased with the life my son has lived. And now he can say the same thing to you. Through Jesus, I'm pleased with your life. I love you. Do you want evidence of that? Read Romans chapter 5, verse 1. 
Therefore, it says, being justified, that means declared not guilty. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and access into this grace in which we stand. 24-7, you have access to your heavenly Father and his grace and his love for you based on what Christ has done and every single day you can wake up knowing that your heavenly Father through Jesus is now saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And those are the best words you can ever hear in your life. Lord, it's good to, for us to be here. But that moment didn't last, did it? In fact, it says here in our, oh, one other thought before I get into that. The Father also says, listen to my son. Listen to him. Some of the best moments in your life have been the times you've listened to the Lord speaking to you in his word. And you have seen the glory of God in such a very special way when all of a sudden something is brought into your heart and brought into your life from the word. It can come from your personal Bible reading, your worship together, or sometimes just the Holy Spirit can bring something back into your memory. He's your comforter. And Jesus said so clearly, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. He says, my sheep know me, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And no one can pluck them from my hand. And he says, they listen to my voice. The best moments of your life are listening to the voice of your shepherd. Following what your father says to you here, listen to my son. Lord, it's good for us to be here. But Jesus did leave them, didn't he? It says suddenly when, or he uh, went back to his position. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Jesus was with them, but he was no longer shining in glory. He's going back to that way he was with them for three years when they walked with him and they saw how tired he was at times and how hungry he was and, and how he struggled even with temptation as they did, tempted in all parts as we are. But yet someday they would see that glory again, shining in a very, very special way. They would see Jesus coming in clouds of glory in the future and taking them home to the place he'd prepared for them. And that's what's waiting for all of us, to share with Peter and John a time when we will see Jesus shining in all of his glory. Oh, I know the sun can look so beautiful and warm this earth in a most marvelous way, 93 million miles away from us. But that's nothing compared to the glory that we will see in Jesus Christ our Lord with Peter, James, and John when he returns in glory. It's interesting what John wrote in his epistle. He said, Dear friends, we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known to us. But when we know he appears, we shall see him, be like him, it says, and we shall see him as he is. There's a story about a New Guinea missionary that was trying to translate this into the New Guinea language, the Bible. And the missionary was working with the native to get the right words. And the native says, oh, we can't translate it like this. We have to translate it, and we shall kiss his feet. No, the missionary says, we're translating exactly as it is. We're going to see him as he is in all of his glory. That's the beatific vision that's waiting for Christians to see Jesus in all of his glory. In the Revelation, John says, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Oh, the sun can shine in all of its glory and bring us warmth and life here on this earth, but nothing compares to that presence that we're going to experience with Jesus in all of his glory. I'd like to end this sermon today with a very special prayer that is very personal, delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ himself the night before he died for all of his disciples. And I'm going to pray this prayer once, and then I'm going to pray it again. And I think you'll understand why I'm saying it twice. These are Jesus' words for you and me and all of his disciples the night before he died. Father, I want those you've given to me 
to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Once again, to have you fully absorb this beautiful prayer. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you've loved me before the creation of the world. Lord, it's good to be here. Amen.